Hi, I'm Charles with Anycap. The story begins as the popular kids at school make their cliche walk through the hallways as everyone gossips about them. Susan A is the student council president superstar, and some certified nerd named Kazuki is her little sidekick that's also the vice president. Some people just turn out to be the center of attention, but our average Joe ordinary protagonist doesn't consider himself one of these people. His name is Usado, and this self-hating guy just thinks of himself as a forgettable run-of-the-mill high school student. The most exciting adventure in this dude's vanilla-flavored life is returning some dumb pigeon babies to their nest. Deep down though, Usado is always hoping for an extraordinary life. Luckily for him, he is the protagonist of this anime. For now though, it's raining and Usado doesn't have an umbrella. Usado's evil side shows itself for a second as he contemplates taking someone else's, but this typical good guy decides against it, fearing the beginning of a life of crime over a $5 umbrella. This proves to be a pretty stupid decision though, as he ends up waiting for hours. Susan A appears out of nowhere and explains that all students are required to leave. This guy really is forgettable as he decides to just run home in the rain, but Susan A stops him. It would look bad for the student council to just watch him get soaked in the rain like a loser, so Kazuki arrives and lends him his spare umbrella. Usado was certain that Kazuki didn't even know of his useless existence and is even more surprised when Kazuki seems to be a nice guy. They offer to all walk home together and Suzune points out that it must be fate that they met. Usado's nerdy mind goes right to video games as he thinks of this moment as suddenly hitting a walking home with two of the most popular kids at school event. He almost ruins this marvelous moment as he says that everyone in school will be jealous, but luckily they didn't hear his utterly embarrassing comment. On their little walk, Usado tells Kazuki that he didn't expect him to be so nice because he only ever sees this playboy rizzing up the ladies. Kazuki only talks to the girls out of pity, and Suzune roasts him by saying that he likes talking to boys better anyway. Suzune is even more unapproachable for our shy protagonist though, as she is the top of her class in all subjects, and great at all sports. Usado glazes her up even more, and points out that she's also beautiful inside and out. Usado, acting like some kind of dumb gossip news reporter, finally comes out and asks if they are dating, since everyone at school talks about it. The walk gets pretty awkward, but they explain that they only spend so much time together because they are on the student council. Usado apologizes for the incredibly stupid question that he definitely should not have asked, but Suzane doesn't mind since it's better than talking behind their back. Their incredibly snooze-inducing conversation continues as the three then talk about what they will do when they graduate. None of these dummies have a plan yet though. Suzune is already a third year, but she has a huge problem. She still hasn't found what she wants to do, and she immediately completes any goal she sets for herself. Seemingly foreshadowing what's about to happen, Suzune explains that she feels like she doesn't belong in this world, and Usado is shocked. The two of them are totally opposite people, but he understands that feeling. This boring conversation has me wishing that Truckoon would pay them a visit as well, but they all stop when the two student council members hear bells ringing. The ringing gets louder and louder, but Usado doesn't hear a single thing. Just as Usado approaches the others, a magic circle appears on the ground, and he wonders if it's a gate to another world. Instead of being terrified, Suzune looks like a psycho and wonders if Usado thinks they will find magic monsters and heroes in this other world. Usado is shocked that she's into that kind of stuff, but time is up and they are taken away. Usado eventually wakes up and finds that they are sitting in front of a king. The boys are rightfully terrified and cautious, but something is wrong with Suzune's brain as she only feels excitement. King Jerkwad has the most basic name ever and introduces himself as Lloyd. Kazuki wants to skip the introductions though and demands to know why Lloyd brought them there. Lloyd keeps his hot-headed guard from slicing Kazuki into pieces for his disrespect and reveals that he is king, as if that wasn't painfully obvious already. The kids are still shocked by this, except for Suzune who is having the time of her life. Lloyd then reveals that they were summoned to be heroes, making all of Suzune's dreams come true. Two years ago, this world was attacked by the King of Demons and his army. They managed to drive them off, but the Demon Lord's power has been growing. As a last resort, they called forth accomplished individuals from another world who can confront the Demon Lord using a forbidden ritual known as Hero Summoning. Usado tries to remind the excited Suzune that they are having a serious conversation and Kazuki goes all crazy. He doesn't care about heroes or Demon Lords and is just furious that they were summoned without consent. He refuses to be isekai since he is not the protagonist and demands that they get sent back to their world. Unfortunately for this side character, the hero summoning only works in one direction, so they can't go back. Kazuki still wants to go back to rizzing up all the ladies back home, but the king apologizes as they are desperate for help. 
Kazuki's whining marathon pushes the guards to finally quiet him down by threatening to turn him from a side character to a non-existent one. Usado calms the hothead down and the king shockingly bows before them. He promises to find them a way back eventually, but begs that these heroes help him in the meantime. Suzuni finally stops fangirling over being isekai'd and wonders why the king calls them heroes without knowing anything about them. Some little dork named Welchi explains that the hero summoning is designed to select accomplished individuals. She explains that hearing the bells ring before being summoned indicates that they are heroes. That's actually some pretty bad news for our boy Usado though, as he was the only one that didn't hear ringing and he wonders if he was brought by accident. Wedgie then takes them to a crystal ball that measures their magical abilities. Kazuki wonders if Usado's really okay with this, but our boy's just fine since Welchi told him that he might be able to use magic even though he isn't a hero. Kazuki thinks Usado should be more upset, but our boy isn't a whiny little dweeb like him, and he points out that they should try to be like the overly excited Suzune. She is the first to be tested, and the color of the crystal indicates her affinity for thunder magic. As if that weren't amazing enough, she also has a ton of mana. Suzune couldn't be any happier, and it is now Kazuki's turn. This guy barely touches the thing, and Wedgie is amazed when the crystal turns white. It's light magic, and Suzune is certain that it means he can shoot laser beams out of his eyes, or even better, he might be able to use swords made of light. Usado points out that Kazuki isn't a weeb like her and probably has no clue what she is talking about, but she scolds him for having a sharp tongue. Suzune realizes that she likes his tongue that way, and Usado's perfect image of Suzune is getting ruined every time she talks. Well, she explains that light magic is incredibly rare and few people can use it. Light repels evil, so its power is unparalleled against demons. The bar has been set pretty high by the first two, but now it's our protagonist's turn. Usado hopes that he will at least have the tiniest bit of power, as this humble kid just hopes to help Suzune and Kazuki any way he can. He is glad when his crystal actually changes color, and everyone thinks it's a soothing color. A look at Welchi though paints a totally different picture, as she is shocked by this color change, and instantly drags Usado away without saying a single thing. Welchi urgently takes him to the king, and explains that the other two have great abilities. However, she is there about something more important. The king has a good chuckle as he jokes about Usado having an affinity for dark magic, but this doofus is shut up when Welchi reveals that the crystal ball turned green. The guards are even shocked and Welchi begins to finally say what that means. King Lloyd stops her though as he doesn't even want her to utter those words and Usado begins to wonder if his magic affinity is really that bad. Our boy just has to remain confused though as the king quickly demands that Usado be taken away from the castle as quickly as possible. They try to think of the safest place to send him, and Usado wonders if he's really that dangerous. He asks if anyone else has the same magic, and there just so happens to be another person. It's a certain girl, but the king doesn't even want her name to be spoken. Unfortunately for King Coward, this girl barges in. Everyone is terrified beyond belief, as we find out that her name is Rose, and she wants to know if the heroes have been summoned. The king was really hoping that she took the day off, but Rose would never do such a thing. She questions if Usado is a hero, but King Lloyd explains that he's just some nerd that got teleported there by accident. This guy desperately tries to hide the truth and tells her that Usado is super ordinary. Rose introduces herself to Usado as the captain of the kingdom's rescue team, but our boy feels that this angry chick is more like the type to take lives, not save them. Wedgie might be a genius because she diffuses the situation and offers to take Rose to the real heroes in the crystal room. Unfortunately, Usado's an idiot that can't read the room and asks the king what his green color crystal meant. Rose is still in hearing distance, so everyone is terrified by what's about to happen. Usado confirms that his ball is green, and Rose tells the king that she will be borrowing the boy. The king decides that he must act quickly and urgently tells Welchi to get Usado away from her. Wedgie uses some kind of bubble magic to quickly get him out of there, but Rose instantly takes off after him. Welchi sends our non-hero sky high, but Rose is able to get to him almost immediately. She is crazy powerful as she destroys the bubble and rapidly captures Usado. Everyone is left with their mouths open from shock like a bunch of guppy fish, and Rose tells the king that she will turn the boy into a full-fledged healing magic user. Wedgie can't handle what will happen moving forward so she faints, and the king begs Rose to stop. He knows that she has been searching for other healing magic users, but he tries to explain that Usado was really dragged into this by accident. His useless words go completely ignored as the two are already gone. Back in the castle, Usado's useless new friends have just been sitting on their stupid hands this entire time, but are shocked to hear that Usado was taken away. 
Well, G explains that his life is not going to be ended, but it's still really bad news. He was taken to the rescue team just beyond the castle town. Healing magic users are extremely rare, and the crazy lady that took him is one of them. She intends to train Usado as her subordinate. No matter how hard Suzune uses her dumb brain, she can't see how this is a problem. Luckily, Wedgie explains it to her like she is a toddler, and reveals that Rose's training methods are extremely unorthodox. At her base, Rose explains that Usado only has the potential to become a healing magic user, so that is why she brought him to the rescue team. This will be his home, and she calls on her boys. Usado is terrified by these extreme dudes, and Rose tells them that they will be looking after him. She tells them to play nice, but these guys look like lunatics and introduce themselves. Usado fears the worst in every possible situation, as he wonders if he's actually some kind of offering, and he is being sacrificed to these monsters. Rose tells them not to scare Usado, but she is the most terrifying of all. The boys try to explain that this is them being nice, but Usado doesn't think these brutes know what being nice means. Rose explains that while these meatheads are her subordinates, they are not healing magic users. There are two other healing magic users on the rescue team, but they usually work elsewhere. It's time to get to business, so Rose explains that she will beat the knowledge on how to use healing magic deep into his tiny little brain. Usado seems to be in a permanent state of disbelief, as every fiber of his being is telling him to stay away from this insane person. Usado uses his Sunday morning church voice to ask if he could learn from another teacher, but Rose ignores the nerd and tells him that training starts tomorrow. She tells the brute named Tong to let Usado stay in his room, and instructs them to eat dinner before getting rest. These guys hit Usado with the brutal reality once she leaves, as they tell him that he is screwed. Rose will be training him herself, and she's going to put him through hell. They say hell might be the least of his worries, and the meatheads have a good laugh at our non-hero's expense. That night, Usado wonders what will happen to him, but he finally shows a bit of optimism, as he is certain that things will be okay. He might be wrong, however, as we see that not even Rose knows what will happen. When Usado wakes up, he explains that he was hoping it was all a dream. Unfortunately, it's not, and he really is in another world. Suzune and Kazuki arrive to visit him, as they heard he was abducted. Usado tells them not to worry, but he has PTSD from the day before, and he gets real depressed when he remembers that he will be starting the training from hell today. He is determined to go through with it though, since he wants to make himself useful. Suzune explains that they will begin their training as well, and they all decide to do their best. When they leave, Usado feels a bit bad for them being thrown into this situation, but quickly remembers that Suzune is having the time of her life. Regardless, Usado just hopes to grow strong enough to support the two heroes one day. Miss Rose startles our boy, but she points out that this isn't a prison, and he can see whoever he wishes. However, that only applies to when he is not training. She gives him a journal so he can record his daily training regimen and how he feels about it. They will have breakfast first, and Usado can't believe that the training from hell will really be starting now. After breakfast, training begins, but Usado doesn't think it's actually that bad. Rose just has him feel the mana in his body and tells him to work on drawing it out. For now, he needs to perfect sensing it, so she has him do some reading. Usado is shocked to see that he can read the language of this world, and it's because summoned heroes automatically have translation magic cast on them. Rose shows how close the demon territory is to the kingdom, and explains that this is why they are always the demon's first target. This book has a bunch of information about the demons and other races in this world, so she leaves him to do some studying. The first day of training seemed quite easy, so he is sure that he will be able to handle it. Day 2 of training is much more different than he expected. It's a lot of running and he wonders if this is really what magic training is all about. On day 3, Usado is forced to run until his muscles are so sore that he can't move. He eventually collapses, but Rose wonders what he thinks he's doing. Usado explains that his legs won't move anymore, but she gives him a good smack and he's shocked to realize that she healed his sore muscles. Rose keeps the intensity up by calling our boy trash, and she commands him to continue running. She tells him to run like he's going to die, and she will revive him so he can keep running. Usado knows he can't tell her how crazy she sounds, so he plans to write it in his journal. On day 4, Usado begins training with the other members, but he ends up falling behind by an entire lap. Everyone trash talks him for falling behind, but he can't talk back, so he decides that he will have to write it in his journal. Day 5 and 6 was more running, with Rose berating him. Usado's anger was building inside him, and he once again planned to give Rose hell in his journal. Just then, Usado was shocked to see the light of healing magic on his hand. 
Training is pretty tough, but not enough to need healing, so it goes away. On day 7, Usado ran until he thought he would die again, and Rose beat him up. She seems more angry than usual, so Usado wonders if she found out that he was dissing her in his journal. He realizes that she can't read Japanese, and wonders if she can just tell by the look on his face that he talks smack in his little diary. Rose launches him into the sky so he can start running again, and Usado vows to call her a vicious gorilla in his journal. Day 8 is more of the same, but on day 9, Usado realizes the need to heal himself. He is surprised to see that he managed to heal his entire body instead of just the part that hurt. Usado realizes that he was wrong about healing magic, and he in fact really, really does need it. On day 10, Usado explains that he doesn't get tired anymore, no matter how much he runs, since he can now manifest healing magic on command. He eventually gets concerned, however, as all he has been doing is running. Usado questions if he will be able to help his friends at this rate, but he knows that Rose would just punch him right in his stupid face if he tried to voice his concerns to her. Rose is upset anyway and gives Usado another 30 laps to run. Usado decides in his mind to no longer call her Miss Rose, as she doesn't deserve any more than just being called Rose. On day 11, the training regimen gets a new addition, push-ups. Usado gets all the way up into the 800s, and Rose finally reveals why Usado is training this way. It's so he can run from his enemies as quickly as possible in battle. This way, he can save his injured allies. She explains that the faster he runs, the faster he can save them. On day 12, he ran until noon, and then did push-ups into the night. On day 13, Rose caught on to the fact that Usado was starting to feel lighter, so she added weights. On day 14, Usado's lunch goes missing, and one of the meatheads admits to eating it. Usado loses his cool and finally strikes back. He has already gotten used to the weights, and he is finally starting to get the hang of training. A week later, Usado's friends come to visit him, and they're shocked to see just how much he has changed in such a short time. This kid is doing some really intense push-ups, and Rose is telling him not to whine about doing something so easy. Usado actually doesn't whine one bit, and even goes as far as to say that doing push-ups with her on his back is easy, because she is so light. Rose is amused by his riz, and tosses another stone on his back. Usado is extremely determined, so his body heals, and he's able to complete the push-up. Rose is pleased with his progress, and determines that she will be able to take him to a certain place sooner than she thought. Suzune is amazed with our boy's newly developed muscles, and Kazuki acknowledges just how brutal the training is. Some dude named Siglis is furious with Rose though, as he thinks that she is destroying Usado. Rose tells him that she does things much differently than the knights do, and she's turning Usado into her right hand man. She needs him to train hard, since it will be a problem if he can't even handle this. Usado is surprised to hear that she wants him as her right hand man, and she explains that it's because she likes how he just can't stand to lose. He never gives up, and most importantly, he has been able to survive her training. Usado realizes that him wanting to teach her a lesson has backfired in the worst way, and Rose tells him to take a break. The friends are told to go with some chick named Celia to take a break, and Siglis tells Rose that he was ordered to re-enlist her. He refuses to do it now though, but Rose says it doesn't matter anyway since her right eye is totally useless. At their lunch break, Usado learns that Siglis commands the kingdom's army. He is the strongest knight in the kingdom, and he is the one teaching Usado's friends how to sword fight. Usado just now realizes that Celia is the princess, and apologizes for behaving so casually. They enjoy some kind of pie thing, and Kazuki wonders if Usado really does that type of training every day. Usado tells him that today was different, but that's only because today was easier. Kazuki explains that their training is going well, but it's not nearly as tough as Usado's. Suzune has lost her mind apparently, as she interrupts their conversation to take a look at Usado's muscles. This dude is seriously shredded now, but Kazuki settles things down by asking if the training isn't too tough for Usado. Usado admits that it's extremely tough, and he wanted to run away at first. Rose is just as scary as ever, but he doesn't want to run anymore. The training is actually starting to get fun for him, and he has realized that life there isn't that bad. Usado's friends think he is amazing, but he just explains that what he is is stubborn. The two of them will have to fight one day, so he wants to be able to support them. They all joke around about how Suzune is a weirdo, and the big guy that ate Usado's lunch has made a meal to replace it. Usado clearly still has a grudge, as he begins to talk just like all the other meatheads, and they begin to argue. Usado is a real hothead now, as the argument quickly turns into a fight, and the big guy promises to knock our boy out. Usado would like to see him try, and they both start throwing hands. Celia wonders if it's okay to just watch, 
and Kazuki tells her that it's fine, since this seems to just be a part of Usado's daily life now. Usado has clearly acclimated very quickly, so Kazuki decides that he needs to go back to training so he doesn't get left behind. Suzune prepares to go as well, but realizes now that all three of them must have been brought to this world for a reason. That night, Usado enjoys a bath and thinks about how he needs to control his riz better so Suzune doesn't lose her composure again. Usado realizes though that she is right, his body has changed dramatically. He has been healing his muscles over and over again after damaging them from this strenuous exercise. The result is that he has gotten shredded. However, his job will be to rescue people on the battlefield and he questions if he has the mental fortitude to match the body he has built. The next morning, Rose informs Usado that they will be going out and the other guys seem worried that this day has come. A guard at the gate nearly wets himself as Rose informs him that she wants to show her subordinate the outside world. He runs off to open the gate for her and Usado thinks about how all she has to do is stand there to scare someone. Outside the gate, Usado wants to know where they are going, but Rose tells him to keep his mouth shut and follow her. They eventually arrive at the forest known as the Darkness of Linger. It's infamous for being filled with monsters and she shockingly tells Usado not to come back until he has hunted down a grand grizzly. Usado thinks there has been a misunderstanding as he reminds her that blue grizzlies only turn into grand grizzlies after living for a hundred years. The book he read even said that just the blue grizzlies are extremely dangerous. Rose explains that he should be able to take one down easily, but Usado points out that he has only been running this entire time and has no idea how to fight. Rose doesn't give a single word of explanation though and just launches him towards the forest. Usado begins to fall from the sky and he panics as he will surely not survive. However, just then, his body begins to glow with his healing magic. Usado finds the determination inside himself to survive no matter what, so he uses his healing magic to brace himself for the impact. Usado can't believe that he survived and he heals himself so he can do what Rose told him. He won't be able to go back until he does, so he tries to have a good attitude about it. He convinces himself that it shouldn't be too hard since it's only a 2 meter tall bear, but he is stunned when it appears behind him. This thing is way bigger than he thought and even its claws are huge. Usado gets a bit confident that the bear won't be able to keep up with his speed, but he quickly finds out that it can. Usado reminds himself that he managed to survive the training from hell and this little teddy bear is nothing compared to Rose. Usado surprisingly turns to face the bear, but Winnie the Pooh with rabies has backup. Usado runs for his life again, but calls the bears cowards for ganging up on him. Just then, Usado hears a waterfall nearby and leaps into it to escape. The bears have no choice but to leave their prey, and Usado uses the time to regather himself. All he has are some rations, a canteen, and a knife, so he wishes Rose would have gave him something he could at least start a fire with. Taking down a grand grizzly is starting to seem impossible at this point, but he will leave that depressing task for tomorrow. Usado is just glad to have survived the first day and sleeps in a pile of leaves. The next day, Usado begins the hunt and decides that he needs to learn more about his enemy. First, he needs to learn where it lives and he finds some scratch marks on a tree. Just then, Usado prepares for the fight of his life as he hears rustling in some bushes, but it turns out to just be an innocent little bunny. It's actually a monster that looks like a rabbit and it seems to be injured. Usado heals the thing up and acts like a bunny whisperer as he tells it to be more careful. Usado continues the hunt, but the bunny follows him. He tries to explain that he's searching for a dangerous monster so it should leave, but the dumb little bunny doesn't listen. This thing just won't leave him alone, so he begins to wonder if the rabbit's trying to show him where the grand grizzly is. Usado follows the little guy and it leads him right to the bears. Usado plans to monitor them without being discovered and notices that they seem to be a family. Usado takes a break to get some unclean water that he's a bit skeptical of and he's shocked to see that the bunny still hasn't left yet. He goes back to continue monitoring and has begun to think that the blue grizzlies are kind of cute. His bunny friend is pretty adorable too, so he begins to think that life in the forest is pretty good. That feeling wouldn't last long however, as the water he drank has a severe effect on his stomach. His healing magic is taking forever to make him feel better, so he determines that he was basically poisoned by the water. A day later, Usado's trusty bunny friend shows him where some clean water is and it's delicious. There is something wrong with Bugs Bunny though and it seems to be because a monster is approaching. Little Bunny wasn't even scared of the Grand Grizzly, so whatever is approaching must be really dangerous. A noise can be heard in the darkness and Usado is shocked when a giant snake appears. 
He is terrified by this unbelievable monster and points out that there was nothing like it in the book he read. Even without knowing anything about it, Usaro can tell that it's dangerous and there is bloodlust oozing from every inch of it. When it leaves, Usaro can finally breathe again and he decides to make it a priority to avoid that thing. Four more days pass, but Usaro can't shake an uneasy feeling he has. He has been observing the bears, but nothing has changed with them, and he can't go home without defeating the Grand Grizzly. Usaro has to do it eventually, so he tells himself that he will do it tomorrow. The next day comes, but Little Rabbit doesn't want him to go. Usaro gives in and decides to stay, but only until the rain stops. When it ends, Usaro begins his mission and refuses to be stopped by Bunny. Usado readies himself for battle, but he is absolutely stunned when he finds that the lives of the bears have already been taken. The bite marks on the bears make it clear that the snake did it, but it didn't do it to eat. It took their lives for fun. The poor cub emerges from some rubble and tries to wake its mom up. Usado thinks about how much he hates losing, especially to Rose. On top of that, he hates the fact that his prey was stolen. As a little bear cries in agony, Usado states that what he hates worst of all is what he's looking at right now. He tells the cub to just wait right there and he vows to get revenge for it. Usado's friends go to visit him but are shocked to hear he has been training in the forest for 10 straight days. They think that seems a bit too long to be training out there but the guys explain that Rose makes all the decisions. Rose isn't there though so these useless guys have no clue what's going on. Kazuki is really worried about Usado, but Suzune thinks he should be fine since Rose wouldn't have sent him unless he was ready. On top of that, Suzune believes in Usado and she is sure he will be back soon. Back in the forest, our boy fuels his body with some snacks and makes a spear. He asks his little bunny to take him to the snake but makes sure to instruct it to run away right after. The bunny takes him on a long journey through the forest and the two finally find the snake. Unfortunately, it is attacking the little cub and Usado is upset since he told it to stay home. This snake is absolutely terrifying to look at, but Usado insists that there's nothing scarier than Rose. Usado thinks the snake looks confused when he begins his attack, but it's not and it almost eats him. Usado counters with a stab to its eye, but he gets knocked back and must heal himself. Usado managed to blind it on one side, so he determines that it's a side he will have to attack from. This snake is insanely dangerous though, and it quickly manages to bite down on our boy's arm. Usado's in immense pain and he is shocked to realize that the snake baited him into attacking its blind spot. Usado is furious to have been tricked but he reveals that the arm it bit was holding his knife. Usado manages to heal his arm enough so that it can move and stabs the snake from inside its mouth. Usado is somehow managing to hold his own but things take a real bad turn as he realizes that he has been poisoned. This is a seriously unfair fight as the snake is both huge and poisonous but Usado has the advantage of being able to heal himself. Getting poisoned by the water forced him to learn how to heal himself from the inside out. Usado does just that and prepares to attack again. This snake is about to end his life with one tail swing though, but the little cub steps in to help. These two have great teamwork right off the bat as the bear lets Usado jump off its back so he can get on top of the snake. Usado uses some foul language to call the snake stupid and he somehow manages to land an insanely powerful punch. Usado is determined to end the battle right now, so he jams the spear further into the snake's head. He yells out as he gives it everything he has and the little bear helps out by pinning the snake down. The snake is eventually defeated and Usado can't believe that they actually did it. The bear seems to have taken a liking to Usado and he points out how they got their revenge. He would like to heal the little cub but he is using up all his mana to neutralize the venom in his body and he can't even move. That's really bad news though as he is shocked when the snake gets back up. Usado can't even move an inch so the little cub tries to help him but Usado just tells it to run away. The snake moves in to end his life and Usado thinks about all the people in his life. He determines that this entire situation is all Rose's fault and he yells out that she is a violent ogre. Just then this violent ogre descends from the sky and shockingly stomps right on the snake. Her angry attitude causes her to call the snake an idiot when Usado wonders how she knew to come help him. Rose reveals that the bunny named Kakuro told her. Kakuro is her pet and she told it to watch over Usado. Usado explains that the rabbit showed up injured and looking for help, but Rose just points out that he is a sucker. Kakuro put on an act to gain his trust and he fell for it. Rose was always nearby in case she needed to step in, but she planned to intervene as little as possible. However, she never thought that the giant snake would appear. 
This snake was created by the Demon Lord's army, and Siglis failed to finish it off during the last invasion. She never thought it would be able to defeat a Grand Grizzly though, since they are strong enough to defeat a full unit of elite troops. Usado can't believe she wanted a rookie like him to take one out, and thinks about how much of a monster she is. Rose explains that she actually never expected Usado to win, and the goal was for him to gain experience, fighting something much stronger than him. Things started to get interesting with Usado though, so she decided to let him keep going to see what would happen. Usado's quick to point out that he almost lost his life, and his little cub backs him up. It has clearly taken a liking to him, and Usado remembers that its parents aren't alive anymore, so it's all alone. Usado gets his new buddy to calm down, and Rose realizes that she was right, Usado's a lot like her. She angrily informs the bear that he will be coming with them, and he will carry the loser that couldn't even lose his life properly. Usado wonders if the cub is really okay with everything, but this is one mature bear, as it's ready to go. They prepare to head back, but Usado can't help but think how terrifying Rose is, as she carries him and the bear over her shoulder. Rose reveals that she heard what he said about her being an ogre. She then terrifies her boy, as she explains that he won't be getting any sleep tonight. They head home, and Rose reveals that Usado actually passed the test with flying colors. Usado is surprised to hear that he is now qualified for something, and Rose explains that he's now qualified to stand beside her on the battlefield. He still hasn't mastered the basics, but Usado definitely has what it takes. He has the ability to withstand pain, physical aptitude, and a strong mental state. The other two healers never earned that distinction, so she tells Usado that he should be proud. Usado wonders what she means when she says that they might be able to make it, and he is shocked when Rose reveals that the demon army will be attacking soon. Elsewhere, the demon lord wonders how preparations are going for the invasion of the Linger Kingdom. Amila, the commander of the third army, reports that their units have finished preparing for battle, and they will soon advance. Rose reveals that Usado will be on the front lines with her, healing the wounded, and he will be part of the vanguard. There are two other healers, but they play a different role. Usado is certain that he can't use healing magic the way she can, but Rose points out that they still have a little more time. She wants him to improve before then, and Usado wonders if he can really do it. Back with the Demon Lord, he explains that he will have Amila lead the army. Despite their previous success, the Linger Kingdom has managed to escape their grasp before. Amila vows to do her best to win the battle, and she is dismissed. Just then, the Demon Doctor mocks Amila for being nervous in front of the Demon Lord. Amila hates this nerd and tells him to focus on his work. His name is Hiraluk, and he reveals that he just completed the newest demon-made monster prototype. It's highly venomous and has a large body with sharp fangs. He calls it demon-made monster prototype 72, Baljanak. Hiraluk's last prototype went missing the last time they attacked the Linger Kingdom. It ran away after being wounded by the enemy known as Siglis. Hiraluk promises that this prototype is way stronger, and Amila hopes so since there are people far more troublesome than Siglis in the Linger Kingdom. They refer to these people as kidnappers, those that stand on the battlefield but don't fight. They carry their injured away without the enemy even realizing it and minimize their own casualties by doing so. Their boss is a healer who runs around all over the front lines healing people on the spot. We see that this is Rose, and Amila is infuriated by her. This is because Rose is a top-notch fighter, and she holds a deep grudge against the Demon Lord. Amila vows to eliminate her, but Hiraluk points out that she can't go into battle herself this time, since she is now the commander. She is well aware, so that is why she plans to send a certain demon. The immortal mage of darkness, the Black Knight. Back home, we see that Usado finally gets to enjoy the comforts of a bed again. He goes to feed his little bear buddy some fruit and snacks on some himself. The little cub is kind of a jerk as he takes Usado's apple and Usado finds that the traitor is there as well. This rabbit toyed with his pure and innocent heart so he stops himself from thinking about how cute it is. He eventually gives in to its adorableness though and feeds it some fruit. Rose arrives and is amused to hear that Usado named the bear Blurin. Blue for its color, rib from the word grizzly. This kid is a total mess as he thinks the name is a good one and Blurin accidentally chomps on his hand. Rose informed the kingdom about the bear so they have been allowed to keep it. Rose will allow it to stay there but informs Blurin that he will have to earn his keep. Blurin is terrified of her just like everyone else and Usado wonders what she will have him do. 
Moments later, we see what she had planned as Usado is carrying Blurin. This will be his simulation training, and Usado is to think of the bear as someone who needs to be rescued. Rose has him start running, but it's a breeze for our boy. It's basically just running with a bit more weight, so as long as he manages his mana, he will be fine. Rose demands that he run faster, since the wounded won't last if he takes too long. Just then, Tong appears out of nowhere, and so does another one of the meatheads. They chase after him, and reveal that Rose told them to simulate the battlefield. The others are waiting to ambush him as well, so they tell Usado to stay focused. One hour later, Usado's dodging one of the meathead's special stink water and avoiding the attacks of some other guy. Three hours later, he is hopping over logs, and four hours later, he is avoiding stomping all over the trader. Eventually, Usado starts feeling strange and begins to wonder what is happening to him. He collapses, and Rose explains that he is at his limit of endurance on the battlefield. Humans feel exhaustion from nervousness, fear, and impatience. That's why he ran out of strength faster than normal. To get better, all he can do is get used to it. Acquire the mental fortitude and decisiveness that never falter in the face of fear. Rose heals him but tells him to spend the rest of the afternoon running around the castle town. Usado is shocked to have to do more and Rose reminds him to carry Blurin. As he runs, everyone is shocked to see a blue bear. Usado expected this though, since even though Blurin is friendly, he is still a monster. The people seem to realize something though and become eerily calm. Blurin leads Usado to some fresh fruit, but our boy doesn't have money. Usado learns that this green fruit is called a peffle and asks the merchant why everyone is so calm when he is carrying a monster on his back. She reveals that it's because they know that Usado is on the rescue team because of his clothes. They see scary looking men from the rescue team all the time, so they have gotten used to it. This makes a lot of sense now, since if those goons faces don't scare them, then nothing will. The nice lady lets them have a peffle for free, so Blurin shoves Usado's hand in his mouth. When they leave, some girl named Amako shows interest in the boy from the rescue team. Usado decides to go visit his friends and doesn't notice when some guy tries to get his attention. Usado eventually figures it out and has to heal the guy. This guy's name is Orga, and he reveals that he is one of the rescue team's healers. Orga is surprised to learn that Usado was summoned with the heroes, and Usado explains that he's been so busy training that he almost forgot himself. Orga is impressed that Usado is able to keep up with Rose's training, since it was impossible for him and his sister. His sister is the other healer, and she is five years younger than him. They run a clinic in the city and use healing magic to heal the citizens. Orga collapsed earlier because he is terrible at healing himself and much better at healing others. They are still part of the rescue team though, so they work under Captain Rose in times of need. Usado wonders what war will be like for them, so Orga explains that Tong and the others bring the injured soldiers to the rear. That is where he and his sister heal them. This guy is shocked when Usado tells him that Rose wants him on the vanguard, and Usado wonders if he can really handle that. Orga explains that the knights and heroes who fight on the front lines are in the greatest danger, so Usado immediately thinks of his friends. When they fall injured and get left behind, normally all they can do is wait for death. However, having a rescue team allows them to be saved. The job is a dangerous and exhausting one, but Rose wouldn't choose someone she didn't completely trust. Before Orga leaves, he asks Usado not to hate Rose too much. He knows she isn't the nicest person, but he explains that it's more like she is just clumsy with people. Usado surprises him though when he reveals that he has never hated Rose, even if he does have unresolved issues with her. When Usado leaves, Orga expresses relief that Rose has finally found someone. Orga's sister Uru arrives and he tells her that he just met someone interesting. They will meet each other soon enough and he is sure that Uru will like him. At the castle, Usado is allowed to enter with Blurin because Rose vouched for him. Usado thanks the guard and he thinks about how a lot of people seem to trust Rose. Usado runs past a bunch of people training and finds Suzune. She is glad to see him but wonders what the blue thing is on his back. Usado tells her about his forest adventure but she just wants to know if she can touch the bear. Usado lets her and promises to heal her if she gets bitten. Suzune considers herself the heroine of their little story, so she is certain that animals are supposed to love her. She is very wrong, however, as Blurin hilariously slaps her hand away. Usado tries to make her feel better by saying that Blurin is just shy and has her try calling his name. Suzune politely asks Blurin to be friends, but he just eats her hand instead. 
Usaro doesn't make her feel better at all this time and suggests that she might have a tainted soul. Usaro has Blurin release her, but Blurin just starts eating his hand now, and Suzune wonders if Usaro has a tainted soul as well. After their little comedy routine, Usaro notices that Suzune's hands are all roughed up, and she explains that it's from going hard during training. Usaro reminds her that she needs to treat wounds properly, so he heals her. Suzune is amazed, and she wonders if Usaro really came just to see her. Usaro points out that he came to see his friends, but that's obviously not what she wanted to hear. Suzune reveals that Kazuki went outside the kingdom to gain experience fighting monsters with Siglis and the others. Siglis informs Kazuki that the Demon Lord will attack soon, and they will surely bring more powerful forces this time. Siglis points out, however, that they have him and Suzune now, so the troops' morale is soaring because they are heroes. Siglis is certain that they will be victorious, but Kazuki seems to have doubts. He gathers himself though and promises to do his best. Just then, they encounter some monsters and prepare for battle. When Kazuki returns, it will be Suzune's turn to gain experience. Usado can tell already that she will have the time of her life, but she wishes he would worry about her. Usado says he does, but Suzune points out he didn't really seem to mean it, and they have a good laugh. Usado leaves and Suzune wonders if Usado even realized how comfortable he has gotten with her. As Usado runs, he thinks about how everyone is preparing for the war, so he wants to be able to help them. In his old world, all he could do is admire people who could do things he couldn't. However, he is not that weak person anymore. That night, Rose is glad to hear that Usado's training is going well, but he explains that he still needs to run more to get used to it. Usado stops her from leaving as he wants to talk about what she said earlier. He points out that he barely survived against the snake monster, so he was terrified when she mentioned the Demon Lord's army. He didn't want to set foot on the battlefield, but today he found a feeling even stronger than fear. He realizes now that he can fight, but he refuses to take any lives. He vows to save anyone he can, and declares that it's because he is part of the rescue team. That's exactly what Rose wanted to hear, since they are going out there to save people. His job is to snatch up the wounded that the enemy is about to finish off. It's also to keep those at death's door alive, even if it means risking his life. Rose wants him to keep spitting up those ideals, since that's how the rescue team must be. This was the first moment Usado actually felt like he was part of the rescue team. The next morning, Rose reveals that the king has sent a message. He wants Usado to head out so he can join Suzune's training outside the castle. Usado is surprised, but we see that Suzune couldn't be more ready. Usado wonders why he has to join Suzune and points out that Kazuki had Siglis with him. Rose explains that Usado was supposed to join Kazuki as well, but he just got back from the forest. She assures Usado that he will only be there in case they need a healer and he should be back home in three days. Suzune is glad to see Usado, but even more excited to have Blurin join them. She assumes that he brought the bear so they can learn to bond, but that is not the case. Usado only brought him because Blurin doesn't like anyone else. Suzune then introduces him to Aruku the Knight and Korin the Mage. Usado recognizes this guy, and it turns out that he used to just be a measly side character that stood watch at the castle gate. Rose explains to Suzune that Usado's healing magic isn't omnipotent. It can heal wounds and cure poison, but it cannot bring people back from the dead. She tells them not to take it for granted, and Suzune completely understands. Rose is certain that they will be fine since Suzune was trained by Siglis, and Rose has nothing to say to Usado. Usado knew she wouldn't have anything nice to say anyway, so Rose leaves them be. Suzune can tell that Rose is really strong, but Usado doesn't know what she means. Suzune just lets it go though, and they set out to begin training. Back at the castle, Sully is worried when she sees Kazuki practicing his sword strikes. She points out that he just got back from training, but he assures her that he got a lot of rest. The shy Sully is glad, but asks him to take care of himself, and she leaves. Suzune tells Usado about how exhausted Kazuki was after training, but Kazuki said that the experience was definitely worth it. He battled a ton of monsters in a clearing by the darkness of Linger, and that's exactly what they will be doing as well. Usado just got back from there, and he wonders if Blurin misses home. Suzune wants to take advantage of the fact that Blurin is asleep by petting him, but Usado watches out for his boy. Suzune doesn't like how he is talking down to her and pushing her back, so she wonders if he has become some kind of misogynist. Blurin finally wakes up, but he is clearly still pretty drowsy as he tries to walk. 
The genius Suzune takes any chance she can get to get close to Blur in, so she offers to carry him on her back. Usado thinks that's a terrible idea, but Suzune loves how fluffy Blurin is. Her joy is short-lived, however, as her body collapses under the weight of the big cub. After Usado heals her, Korin detects multiple entities ahead of them. Aruko tells the others to get back, and some bandits appear disappointed to have been found. They were planning an ambush, so they decide to try and rob our group. Aruka refuses to give up any goods, but the bandits point out that they are way outnumbered. Usado takes one look at the sorry bunch and thinks about how they aren't intimidating at all. Usado assures Suzune that they aren't a threat, but she's just amazed to see bandits for the first time. The guys are terrified to see a blue bear, but they realize that it's just a cub. These horrible guys decide to catch it and skin it alive, but Suzune instantly comes to his defense. Usado is impressed that Suzune used such a powerful attack while managing not to end the guy's lives, and he encourages her to go all out. The bandits decide to avoid the magic attacks by getting in close range. Usado treats Suzune like a Pokemon and instructs her to use Thunderbolt. Suzune easily wrecks the bandits, but she does not like being treated like Pikachu. Aruku joins the fight, but they are interrupted by a horde of boars. This is shocking since they live much deeper in the forest, and Blurin must step in to push some of them back. Usado takes a hit while protecting Suzune, and uses his healing magic to brace their fall. They end up falling through some trees and into a river, but Suzune is in bad shape. Usado realizes that this is the same river he jumped into before, and remembers that there is a waterfall ahead. He tells Suzune to take a deep breath, and blacks out. When out of the river, Suzune sees that Usado isn't waking up, so she vows to get him to safety. She plans to repay her debt for him saving her, but Usado reveals that he just woke up and he is fine. He is only a little embarrassed now, but so is she. Usado explains that he was just taking a break after pulling her out of the water, but everything is fine now. Usado heals her up while she apologizes, but he explains that he wouldn't want to be stranded with anyone else other than her. Usado then explains that Rose left them in this forest before, and it's filled with monsters that make those boars they just saw look like pets. A check of their inventory reveals that they don't even have enough food to last one night. Suzune thinks they should prioritize escaping the forest if it's really as dangerous as he says, but Usado points out that it's going to get dark soon. It might also rain, so they need to find a spot to camp for the night. Usado says they can sleep on a tree branch like he did before, but Suzune reveals that she has never climbed a tree before. She always wanted to, but she was never allowed to. Usado wonders if she was raised by strict parents and decides that they can just take shelter from the rain in a little cave. Usado recommends that she get out of her wet clothes, but she makes him promise not to peek first. Afterwards, Suzune uses her lightning ability to catch some fish. She then uses it to start a fire, and Usado couldn't be happier to have her around. Suzune awkwardly sits away from Usado and notices that he is even more ripped than before. Just then, some venom monkeys appear. Usado only read about them, and this is his first time seeing them in person. Suzune thinks one of the babies is cute, and Usado explains that they aren't aggressive. He warns her not to touch them though, as they are venomous, but Suzune is already petting away. She has accepted that this is the price to pay for enjoying its cuteness, but the little monkey bites her. Suzune confidently points out that she was right, since there is nothing to fear, but she collapses. At the castle, Corin's familiar has informed the king that Suzune and Usado have gone missing. The king wasn't going to tell Kazuki, but Celia made him. The king explains that the search team will be ready tomorrow, but Kazuki isn't satisfied with that. Kazuki heads off to search himself, but Rose stops him. She explains that Suzune and Usado are likely together. This means there is nothing to worry about, as Usado is her subordinate and he won't die so easily. Back in the forest, Usado's having a way better time with Suzune around, as surviving this time is a breeze. Suzune doesn't like being talked about like she is camping equipment, but Usado actually really appreciates her being there. Usado decides that they should take turns sleeping, so he lets her go first. She refuses though, and tells Usado to sleep since he must be tired from all the healing he has been doing. As it begins to rain, Suzune checks to see if Usado is sleeping yet, but he is still awake. Suzune wonders if he ever wants to go home, which he does, but he explains that he also has a reason to stay. Suzune doesn't hesitate to say that she doesn't want to go back, and is surprised that Usado doesn't ask why. She wants him to ask, but Usado thinks he already knows. He correctly assumes that it's because she likes this world better. Suzune explains that she feels like there is nothing left for her in their old world. Her family, her friends, and even her old self, she would throw it all away to stay in this new world. 
She has waited her entire life for a chance to be free, and in this world, there is nothing tying her down. Suzune would trade anything for this freedom, and she is surprised when Usado understands. She thought he would be disappointed by who she really is, but Usado explains that he was tired of his old self as well. Tired of his ordinary life and passive self. When they first arrived, Usado just didn't want to hold his two friends back. However, now he is determined to protect her, Kazuki, and the people of the kingdom as a member of the rescue squad. Suzune understands and proclaims that she wants to protect the people as a hero. They make a pact to forget their old world and protect their here and now. Suzune is amazed by how much her boy has grown, and Usado points out how she is much more relatable now. Usado used to think that she was just a perfect girl, but Suzune is surprised since he has been treating her pretty casually. She doesn't mind though since she'd rather be close to him than admired from afar. Things get a bit awkward so Usado goes to sleep, but Suzune teases him about being flustered. Suzune is glad that they had their little chat and wishes him a good night. The next morning our pair look for a way out of the forest, but can sense that a beast is approaching. This beast turns out to just be Blurin, who ends up smothering Usado. Aruku is with him but also exhausted. When he recovers, Aruko explains that they were searching the perimeter of the forest when Blurin rushed off on his own. They chased after him and they realize now that Blurin must have picked up on Usado's scent. Just then, Blurin picks up on another scent and Usado explains that this was Blurin's home. He tells the tragic story of what happened to Blurin's parents and everyone feels bad for the little cub. Blurin is clearly ready to leave and Suzune points out that he seems to have made a decision. Blurin must know that his place now is by Usado's side. It's time to go home and they declare that they will be going where they belong. Usado and Suzune return to the castle where the king is glad to see that they are back from the forest. Suzune apologizes for making them worry but the king explains that he should be the one apologizing. He does apologize for getting Usado mixed up in all of this but our boy has gotten used to being in situations like those. Usado quickly realizes that being used to extreme situations might look bad for Rose so he lies and says that he was talking about his old world. The king is eager to hear about how Usado's rescue squad training is going and our boy lies again and says that it's been nothing but smooth sailing. Usado is shocked by Rose's face since it looks like he said exactly what she wanted him to and he wonders if he has been conditioned by her on a psychological level. The two of them are dismissed but Rose and Siglis are told to stay behind. This guy's face was pretty grave so Usado wonders what they are talking about. Kazuki arrives but he thinks that Usado is behaving way too casually. He was very worried about them and Salia explains that Kazuki was ready to dash out of the castle for them. Suzune calls him reckless but Usado reminds her that she was the one that got bitten by a poison monkey. Usado tries to share the little story but Suzune is way too embarrassed to let him. Kazuki tells them how Rose assured him that they would be fine in the forest but Usado thinks about how what she probably really meant was that the woods are easy mode compared to her training. Kazuki was in awe of the confidence she had in Usado but Usado thinks that he's just a pure and innocent boy for taking Rose's words at face value. Usado asks that he never change and declares that only himself and Rose need to be tainted. The group separates and Salia points out how close they are. Kazuki assumes that she means Suzune and Usado, but she explains that she was talking about all of them. Kazuki looked like he was having a lot of fun with them there, and he points out that it's because they were already friends before coming to this world. Celia would like to be one of their friends, so she asks Kazuki to not address her formally anymore. She apologizes for being so forceful, but her message is received and Kazuki agrees to just call her Celia from now on. In the castle, the king explains that they have interrogated the bandits who attacked Usado's group. Minister Sergio reveals that these bandits noticed far fewer monsters than normal in that area. Soon after, they were attacked by a herd of fall boars in the forest. This surprising information means that the monsters must be fleeing the plains for the forest. They are fleeing from something horrible and Siglis predicts that it's a demon lord's army. Unlike their previous battle, the demon lord won't underestimate them again so they will likely attack with everything at their disposal. The king has the men inform the others in charge of war to be ready and he has a request for Rose as well. This isn't something he would normally ask of the rescue squad leader but Rose says that she is prepared. She has already determined that the king wants her to find out how far the demon lord's army has come and he apologizes for asking for something so dangerous. Rose already knows that she is the fastest person in the entire kingdom so she agrees to go. 
The king has another request and asks her to return to her post as the battalion commander. Rose refuses and explains that she bears more guilt than he seems to realize. The king reminds her that she was the first healer ever to be appointed battalion commander and he wonders why she's so hard on herself. He then realizes that she hasn't forgiven herself. She explains that she has accepted the deaths of all her subordinates and the fact that no amount of healing will bring them back. The scar that has been carved into her right eye will never let her forget them. The king tries to explain that it's not her burden to bear, but she points out that they died because she was too full of herself. This scar is her punishment and it will never let her forget her sins. That is why she created the rescue squad. Not to fight, but to focus on saving lives. The king points out that the rescue squad saved many lives in the war two years ago, but that isn't enough for Rose. The rescue squad has another purpose as well, and that is to help her find a subordinate who will not die. The king points out how that's not humanly possible, but Rose explains that that's what all the training is for. Healing magic that determined to push one's body beyond its limits, and an iron will that will never bend in the face of an opponent. She has been searching for someone who has all three of these traits, and that person is Usado. He has survival instincts, adaptability, and the will to live. On top of all that, he keeps standing up to her, and he will never give up. He is a cheeky brat, and reminds her of the guys who are no longer with them. That is why she is determined to make him the ideal healer. Rose apologizes for getting carried away with her little speech, and heads for the border. That night, Usado finds that Rose left a letter for him. It reveals that there won't be training tomorrow, and she instead wants him to deliver another letter. Rose told the guys that she won't be there for dinner, so Usado wonders where she is. Elsewhere, the demons are building a bridge, and Emila demands that her subordinates give their all for the demon lord. The Black Knight watches this, and declares that she's being way too enthusiastic. It annoys him, but Emila reminds him that she is his commanding officer. He points out that they were at the same level in the second army, but things are different now and Amila demands that he obey her. The Black Knight begrudgingly agrees and Amila tells Hira Luke that the bridge will be complete in a few hours. Once it's finished, their invasion of the Linger Kingdom can finally begin. Just then, the demons find that a Linger scout has appeared, but Amila doesn't care. By the time this scout spreads the word, it will already be too late. This lady clearly has no clue who this scout really is, as Rose launches an entire tree trunk to destroy their bridge. The tree trunk was thrown from really far away, and Amelia is furious when she realizes that it was Rose. This was only supposed to be a reconnaissance mission for Rose, but she's glad to have bought them some time. The next day, Usado goes to deliver the letter, but can't understand why people are staring at him, even when he doesn't have Blurin. The old merchant offers to let him have some fruit, but he doesn't have time. He decides to come back later, and the creepy girl from earlier stares at him. Usado arrives to deliver the letter, and Uru tries to remember his name since her brother Orga told her about him. She eventually remembers and introduces herself. Usado is standing in the Fleur Clinic, and it is run by Orga and Uru. Orga is examining a patient, and Usado feels a bit weird when Uru lets him take a peek. They must be quiet as Orga is concentrating, and Usado's amazed to see how intense the color is of Orga's healing magic. Its flow is also very smooth, which Usado notices is nothing like his own. Orga fixes the kid right up, but the kid wonders who the weirdos watching them are. Afterwards, Uro wonders how everyone in the rescue squad is doing, and Usado explains that they're all still walking around with ugly bad guy faces. Usado remembers hearing that she was part of the rescue squad, but she explains that unlike Usado, she wasn't able to keep up with the training. Reading the letter clearly bothers Orga, but he keeps it a secret. Uru then explains that Rose put everything into training her and her brother when they first joined the squad. They were really excited about it, but it didn't work out. Not only did Uru struggle to keep up, she also became really afraid of Rose. Rose seemed desperate back then, but Uru points out that she seems much happier now. Usado has a pretty jaded view of Rose though, and thinks that she is just happy because she has a new punching bag. Just then, Orga is informed that someone fell off a roof while trying to fix it. Two others were injured as well, so Orga asks Usado to come with them. When they arrive, Usado wants to hear Orga's plan, but the doctor is exhausted. They eventually start healing, but Usado thinks about how besides himself, he has only ever healed Orga and Suzune. 
Their injuries weren't even that bad, but he realizes that if war really breaks out, then he will most likely have to treat injuries even more severe than what he faces now. Even worse, he will have to do it mid-battle. Orga reminds Usado to remain calm and explains that who Usado treats or where he treats them doesn't matter. Usado has the power to heal them, so Orga tells him that he just needs to believe that he can do it. These words remind Usado that even Rose believes in him, so he starts believing in himself as well. This calms him down a great deal and he's able to heal the idiot that fell off the roof. Afterwards, the siblings compliment our boy on a job well done and Orga even asks him to stop by some time to lend a hand. Usado agrees and heads home. Uru thinks Orga looked pretty cool when giving Usado advice, but Orga gets really serious. The letter revealed that the Demon Lord's army is close and they have been summoned to war. Usado doesn't have any war experience, so he must rely on an absolute confidence in his own abilities. Orga is confident that Rose knows what she is doing, but he declares that he will do everything he can too. War is starting, but Orga assures his sister that everything will be okay. Usado goes to collect his fruit, but wonders if a girl is lost when she stops him. This strange girl says that Usado is the only one who could see it, and that is why this is a future he can change. Usado has no clue what this little chick is talking about, but his confusion turns to shock when her eye begins to glow. Usado then sees shocking images of war, and what's even more horrifying is that he sees the Dark Knight kill his friends. Usado's heart beats rapidly, and he is so horrified that he can barely move. The girl explains that she has just done him a great favor, and he now has a duty to repay her. Usado still can't believe what he just saw, and the mysterious little girl just runs off. Usado chases after the little girl as he's determined to question her about why he saw the death of his friends. The girl watches him nearby and thinks about how Usado is the only one that can change the future. Usado questions a guard if he has seen the little fox girl, but he hasn't. Rose arrives to scare the guy away, so Usado pities him for being terrified by Rose. Usado can understand him though, as Rose manhandles him. She wants to hear more about how scary she is, but Usado manages to change the conversation into where she has been. Rose reveals that she destroyed a bridge that the demon army was trying to make while she was scouting. Usado has a serious smart mouth as he points out that she did a lot more than just some scouting, but this just gets him manhandled again. Rose explains that she has seen the fox girl before, and she appeared there two years ago. The fox girl is only 12 years old, but she somehow managed to evade bandits and kidnappers to arrive at the capital. Demi-humans like her are extremely valuable to bandits, since they are prized for their physical appearance. More importantly though, some even have an aptitude for rare magic. Usado wonders if this rare magic is able to show people visions of the future that they hope never happen. Rose reveals that there are rumors of beastmen who can use magic called precognition. They are extremely rare, and even if they existed, they would be well guarded back in the beastlands. Rose probes further about why he wants to know, but Usado pretends that he was just wondering about the beast people since he read about them in a book. That night, the king thanks Rose for buying them some time, but she points out that the demon army will likely be building another bridge soon. It will only take a couple of days to finish, so the king decides to inform the soldiers and citizens about the invasion. He will do it tomorrow, but he wants to speak with Suzune and Kazuki before the night is over. On their way to see the king, Usado's friends run into Celia. Kazuki has a pretty awkward interaction with her, and after exchanging pleasantries, they part ways. Suzune wonders what happened between them, but Kazuki says it was nothing. Elsewhere, Usado finds that he can't fall asleep. He can't stop thinking about the vision, and how if it is the future, there is nothing he can do about it. However, he remembers that the fox girl told him that he's actually the only one that can change this future. Just then, Usado spots something outside, and it turns out to be Kazuki. The two talk about how much they have been training, and Kazuki reveals that they just spoke with the king. They were told that the battle with the Demon Lord's army will soon begin, but they both already knew that. However, when Kazuki pictured himself fighting, he couldn't fall asleep. He admits that he ran away from the castle to come here, and reveals that he is scared to fight. It's not just now, he was even scared when he fought monsters for the first time. His legs froze up, and he only managed to fight at the last second. It was only when the fight ended that he realized just how lightly he has been taking everything. He can see things more clearly now, and realizes that the Demon Lord's army will do everything they can to kill him. He is terrified of this, but he is under extreme pressure because everyone is counting on him. 
Usado breaks the tension by telling Kazuki how cool he is. Usado always thought that he never got scared, but he realizes now that that is not the case. The expectations of those around Kazuki have been an immense burden. Usado points out that Kazuki doesn't actually have to live up to those expectations, and sometimes he can put himself first. As for Usado though, he confidently explains that he will be going to battle. He wants to save those who will fight the Demon Lord's army. Usado is of course scared as well, but he has already made his decision. Kazuki reminds Usado that he was just dragged into this by accident, and now he can even die. Usado admits that he was brought by accident, but a lot has happened since then. There have been tough times, but he has also met a lot of people that have showed him the way. He wants to help them, and that includes Kazuki. Usado points out that even if Kazuki doesn't fight, they will be friends either way. These words turn out to be just what Kazuki needed to hear. Kazuki snaps himself out of depression and declares that he will fight to protect Usado and Suzune. He isn't sure if he can fight as a hero, but he definitely knows that he wants to help his friends. Kazuki refuses to just watch and proclaims that he will take his fear and fight in spite of it. Having his friends by his side reassures him more than anything, so they agree to protect everyone together. Usado realizes that he just said a bunch of corny stuff, but Kazuki assures him that it's exactly what he needed to hear. Afterwards, Usado hopes to forget his corny speech with some sleep, but Suzuni appears to laugh at their bromance. Usado says that he's too tired to deal with her mockery, but she goes on to mock him even more. Usado knows that she followed Kazuki because she could tell that something was wrong, but she is glad to see that Usado took care of it. Usado admits that there is a part of him that doesn't want to fight, and Suzune wonders if he doesn't want her to fight either. Usado would rather she not, but he knows that she has already decided to live in this world. This is true, so she leaves, as they all have a big day tomorrow. The next day, the king makes his announcement. It's only a matter of time before the Demon Lord army invasion, so he plans to intercept them in the grasslands. Two years ago, they pushed back the Demon Lord's army, but he is sure that they have gotten stronger since then. It won't be easy, but he reminds everyone that they have gotten stronger as well. He points out that they have two heroes now, and Kazuki and Suzune. They also have the help of the rescue squad, who play a critical role on the battlefield. The king concludes his speech by assuring them that they will win, and everyone gets hyped. Later, Kazuki goes to see Celia. He apologizes for coming unannounced, but she is actually glad. He confirms that they will be going into battle, so she prays for his safety. He swears to protect the country, but more importantly he promises to come back to see her. The shocked Celia hopes he will, and the two say goodbye. Elsewhere, Uru fawns over Blurin. Usado lets her pet him, but warns that Blurin might not allow it. Uru is certain that they will be the best of friends, but she is severely mistaken as Blurin slaps her hand away. Blurin keeps slapping her away, so she's glad to see that a little bunny has appeared to make her feel better. This girl just can't catch a break though, as Kokoro teams up with Blurin to push her away. Usado must then keep Orga from crushing himself to death, and they watch as Uru continues to try and pet Blurin. Orga reveals that she's actually really nervous since it's her first time in battle. Her erratic behavior is just her way of hiding her anxiety. Usado is then called to go see Rose, but he just now realizes that he has never been to her room before. Usado fears that she has decided to torture him, but he arrives to find that she just wants to talk. She wants Usado to explain his role on the battlefield, so he says that it's to heal the injured with her on the front lines. That is only partly correct, as the beginning of the battle will be different. The other squad members will bring the wounded back to the rear, and they will treat them there along with Orga and Uru. There won't be many wounded on the front lines at the start, so they would just be sitting ducks there. Furthermore, Rose tells them not to heal the wrong people on the front lines. Usado thinks that she means not to heal the enemy, but she calls him an idiot as that's not what she means. There will be people that are injured but still fighting. He shouldn't try to heal these people, since he will just get in their way. It will be up to Usado to use his judgment to decide who to heal at a moment's notice. Usado completely understands, and Rose finally gives him his rescue squad uniform. It was designed this way because it was made to help them stand out on the battlefield. Our boy Usado couldn't be happier, so she tells him to put it on. Rose is glad he put on so much muscle, since Usado is able to fill the suit up well because of it. Rose manhandles him once more to explain that healers are not immortal. Once they die, it's over. The one thing he can never do on the battlefield is take his life for granted. 
Usado explains that he obviously doesn't want to die, but this just makes Rose call him an idiot again. Talk is cheap as Rose knows plenty of people that talk the way he does and died anyway. Being part of the rescue squad means that he must save himself too, so he shouldn't underestimate the value of his own life. Rose doesn't want to hear any self-sacrificing talk from him, or she promises to end his life before the enemy does. Usado hears her message loud and clear, and confidently declares that he will save everyone, including himself. She questions if he can really do it, but he reminds Rose that she was the one that told him to speak his ideals. Usado thinks about the vision he saw, and determines that it doesn't matter if it really is the future. He knows what he must do, and that is to not let Kazuki or Suzune die no matter what. Later, our heroes head out to a camp where they will prepare for battle. It's taking a bit too long to get there for Uru's liking, but they have to get a safe distance from the kingdom before they can fight. Usado wonders what the demons are like, so Rose explains that they look like humans, but they are stronger and have more mana. This isn't just true for their commanding officers, as even their regular soldiers are really strong. Rose wonders if he is scared, but our boy Usado points out that he knows someone way scarier. Rose can't believe some little smart mouth that came to this world by accident would turn out to be as strong as he is. Usado reminds her that she put him through crazy training to get him this way, and he admits that at first, he was just trying to outdo her. Usado prepares to get yelled at for his smart mouth, but he is surprised when it never happens. This is because Rose has gotten very serious, and she remembers her old squad. A look back to five years ago shows when Rose was the battalion commander of the Linger Knights. The kingdom just received a report of demon sightings in the grasslands near the darkness of Linger. The king issues an order to have guards protect merchants passing through there, but he points out that the demons are far stronger than humans, and contact with them should be avoided at all costs. Siglis and Rose fear that the demons are planning to invade, so Siglis plans to have his troops ready just in case. Rose is in deep thought as she plans to have her battalion prepared as well, so she ignores some girl trying to get her attention. Rose scolds this girl named Aul, but Aul is upset since Rose could have cracked her skull open. Aul wonders how serious the demon situation is, but Rose scolds her again for eavesdropping on a top secret meeting. Rose assures her that the situation isn't that big of a deal, and Aul is certain that they could handle it either way. Rose reminds her to never underestimate their enemy, and she decides that she will oversee everyone's training later. That's the last thing Aul wants, so she tries to remind Rose that she has a lot of other responsibilities to deal with. They return home, and Rose declares that it's time to get everyone back into shape. The other knights blame Aul for bringing this torture upon them, and they take out their frustrations on her. Aul begs for help, but Rose just ignores her. One week later, more reports reveal that the demons are attacking monsters in their territory, so Rose is sent to investigate. Rose informs her knights about this mission, and she explains that she was told that there are 10 to 30 enemies. Aul tries to encourage the bunch, but they still blame her for the intense week of training that they just went through. Aul tries to point out that they are stronger because of it, but this just gets them more upset. Rose knows that Kakuro would be able to detect monsters for them, but this mission is too dangerous, so she has decided that her bunny friend will have to stay home this time. Rose reveals to everyone that she will be joining them on this mission, and everyone gets excited since they are invincible when the commander fights with them. They will be able to fight to their fullest, since Rose can just heal them whenever they get injured. Owl encourages them to give it their best, and they finally all agree with her. The next morning, Rose and her knights make their way through the forest. They don't find anything on the first day, so Aul explains that the commander has decided that they will explore the west side of the forest. That area is pretty dangerous, so they will have to leave their horses here, but the others wonder if they should check the other areas first. Aul states that it's not necessary, since she has a feeling that something is on the west side. The others take a moment to think about it, but they happily agree to do as she says, as they respect her as their deputy commander. It's time for them to rest, so Rose decides that she will take first watch. Everyone sleeps, but Rose can tell that Aul is still awake. Rose offers to knock her into unconsciousness, but Aul has something to ask her. She wants to know why Rose chose her as deputy commander. Aul thinks she is pretty average, and there's nothing special about her. Rose has trained everyone to be the best, but Aul points out that she pretty much just runs errands. Rose points out that Aul hasn't messed up at all, so she has no complaints. Owl explains that she's always desperately doing her best, and she is shocked when Rose reveals that that is why she will be able to hand over the title of commander to her one day. 
Aoi freaks out because she thinks the others would go crazy, and she thinks about how she used to be. Aoi was always stubborn and never listened to orders she didn't like. No one was able to control her, and whenever anyone complained about it, she would shut them up with her strength. Aoi was famous for being a strong knight that didn't listen to her superiors. Aoi then met Rose, but she stayed the same stubborn person. The only difference was that Rose didn't let her walk all over her. Rose whacked her when Aul didn't listen and chased her down when she tried to flee past the border. Then when Aul tried to punch her, Rose hit her so hard that she lost consciousness along with all memories of the incident. Rose doesn't remember hitting her that hard, but Aul thinks she must be joking. Aul explains that she never wanted Rose to get the better of her. No matter how hard the training was, she always wanted to succeed and hated losing. It didn't seem like much to Rose, but it was a huge change for Aul. She never had someone look after her to the very end without giving up. Everyone else eventually got fed up, but Rose continued to challenge her. Aul thinks the other knights feel the same way. Rose understands them best, which is why she's the only one that can be their commander. Rose calls her a brat that doesn't want to leave the nest, and Aul is stunned that this is how she responds to her touching speech. Rose agrees that she understands them best, which is why she should be trusted to pick their next commander. She explains that she didn't pick Aul at random. She picked her because she never gives up and always looks forward. That mentality is the stable foundation that the others stand on. As long as Aul just keeps being herself, the others will follow her. Aul seems to finally be understanding, but Rose just wants to knock the cheesy grin off her face. Rose points out that the world is always changing, so Aul will have to learn to accept that. However, the fact that she was once their commander will never change. There's no need to think about it so deeply, so Aul finally understands. Rose tells the others that it's time to sleep, and Aul is shocked to see that everyone was listening. They all declare how much they trust Aul, and point out how they always listen to her when it counts. The embarrassed Aul wants all the compliments to end, so she threatens to beat them all up before the demons do. The next morning, they find signs of the demons hunting monsters. Coming to linger territory just to hunt monsters doesn't make much sense, so they wonder if they're doing it just for fun. Aul suspects that there must be some other reason, but they are interrupted by a loud noise. They find some demons nearby, but they are discovered instantly. Rose tells the others to stay back and demands to know what the demons are doing in their territory. The demon explains that he actually doesn't like this mission, but he must do it as they will benefit greatly in the future. He refuses to explain further, so Rose tells them to leave. If they go home quietly, then she will let everything else slide. The demon is impressed with how bold she is being, but he declares that he cannot allow them to live. Rose leaves Aul in command and explains that she won't be able to give orders while she's fighting with the demon leader. The battle begins and Aul declares that they will show the demons the power of their teamwork. The demon tries an attack, but Rose shows her insane speed and knocks him back. The demon doesn't even have time to think as Rose follows that attack up quickly and eventually sends him flying. Rose already knows that she can't land a good hit as this demon was able to manipulate the wind in a split second. Rose leaves the rest to her knights and she goes after the demon leader. She battles it out with him and stops his movement by launching giant trees at him. Rose shocks this dude with her relentless barrage of attacks but he isn't even close to being done. Rose continues attacking, so the demon admits that he has never seen a human with her speed. She has no interest in talking though, and just wants to bash his face in. The demon surrounds her with his wind blades, but Rose is just as confident as ever. The demon thinks she is stupid to risk her life by crossing the wall of wind blades, but he is shocked when Rose begins healing herself. He just now realizes what her magic is, but it's too late as she lands a punch. The demon now knows that she is a healer. Her immense physical strength and high-speed healing make her a strong melee fighter. He acknowledges her as a monster and they introduce themselves. This guy's name is Nero. He summons his weapon and declares that he will now kill Rose. Rose has no fear at all and proclaims that she will beat this guy down before he can. Back at the other fight, one dude uses an ability to put a demon to sleep. Aul lands an attack as well and declares that they need to show the power of Rose's personal unit. Rose is busy fighting Nero, and she realizes that his demon sword is imbued with a curse. She cannot let it touch her no matter what. Just then, Nero does manage to cut her face, but she lands a counterattack. He is sent back near the others, and Rose heals herself. She knows that Nero isn't done just yet, so she demands that he get up. Nero is impressed by her and her subordinates. 
They are quite skilled and easily the most troublesome group he has ever encountered. Nero thought that true heroes no longer existed among the humans. He has changed his mind, however, as Rose and her group have become their biggest obstacle. Nero's sword begins to glow with darkness, and he declares that the era in which demonkind trembles before the humans will end, as their lord will soon awaken. This lord is merciless, savage, and cruel, but he brings the demons blessings and victory. This guy shocks Rose when he releases a bunch of power, and states that he must defeat her group so they can awaken their lord. The fight begins to turn as one of Rose's subordinates lands an attack, but she realizes that the demon isn't affected. The demon proclaims that they are simply weapons of the demon lord, and if they lose their life, they will just take them down with them. Rose can tell that she is in trouble, so she rushes to her companion, but she is stopped by Nero. The demon stays true to his word and takes the girl's life, horrifying everyone. Another member of Rose's group gets eliminated, and it becomes clear that these demons no longer care about their own lives. Owl tries to calm everyone down, but it's no use as another one of their comrades falls. Nero takes credit for this turn in the fight, as he points out that he urged his men to sacrifice themselves. Rose attacks him with rage, but Nero points out that she has lost her composure, and he cuts her eye. She tries to heal it, but Nero reveals that his sword cuts away mana. Her wound is cursed, and she won't be able to heal it. Her troops are begging for some healing as they are being destroyed in the fight. Rose tries to end her fight with Nero, but it's no use. She can only see out of one eye, so it's affecting her sense of distance. Nero moves in for an attack, and she realizes that it's all over. Nero lands a devastating attack, but Rose is shocked when she sees that Aul sacrificed her own life to save her. Rose is then horrified to see that her entire unit has been eliminated. Rose feels terrible since they all believed in her. They all thought that they wouldn't die on her watch, and she would always come to their rescue. Rose wishes that Owl would have just run away, and she blames herself for being so weak. Nero declares that the deaths of their subordinates will not be forgotten, and he goes in to finish the fight. Just then, he is shocked when Rose stops his blade. She begins to beat this guy down, and insults him for what he said. The angry Rose points out that a demon like him, who urged his own troops to sacrifice themselves, could never understand. She continues absolutely destroying Nero, and explains that sacrificing oneself in battle is the ultimate humiliation. Rose has completely taken over the fight as she pins Nero to a tree, and she angrily states that she will now kill him. Rose can tell that her body is about to fail, but she is determined to be the one that ends Nero's life. Just then, a young Amila appears worried about Nero, and Rose can't understand this at all. Nero is a demon that sacrifices his own subordinates, so she can't believe that there is one that wants to save him. Rose tries to stop her from rescuing him, but this girl reminds her of Aul. They leave and the real Aul calls out to her. The greatly injured Rose makes her way to her trusty subordinate, and she tells her to stop talking so she can heal her. Aul explains that healing her will be impossible since she was cut too deep. Rose finds this to be true as her healing fails, but she is determined to keep trying. Owl tells her that it's hopeless, but she states that she has no regrets. She was happy to fight by Rose's side, and she knows that the others felt the same. Rose can't believe what she is hearing, and refuses to let her die. Owl uses her last words to ask that Rose never change, and she dies. A look around the battlefield reveals the massacre that just took place, and Rose screams in agony. Later, Rose reports to the king that the demon lord will soon be resurrected. Rose states that she no longer has the right to call herself a knight. Because of this, she would like for him to remove her as battalion commander and revoke her knighthood. Everyone is shocked, but the king does as she wishes. Later, the family of one of her fallen subordinates approaches her. She shamefully apologizes for not being able to protect him, but they thank her for at least bringing him back so they could see him one last time. They explain that their son was a complete delinquent since he just watched anime recap videos all day long. However, when he started serving Rose, he became a changed man. Rose returns to her empty home and cries in a corner. A month later, Siglis goes to visit her and they discuss how the king came to see her earlier. Their goals are both the same as they are checking to make sure that Rose hasn't decided to follow her troops to the afterlife. Rose considers it for a moment, but this just upsets Siglis. Rose tells him to calm down though, as she wasn't being serious. Rose explains that the demon's curse was only temporary, so her wounds are starting to finally heal. Siglis wonders why she hasn't made an effort to heal her eye, but she doesn't answer. However, when she's alone, Rose thinks about how the scar is proof of her sin and letting her subordinates die. 
It's a punishment so she never forgets what happened. Rose has decided to cherish her own life since I will sacrifice herself for it. The question now is what she will do with it. She considers getting revenge and defeating as many demons as she can, but that's not the answer. Rose manages to calm herself down and she begins to have memories of everyone. She just now realizes how weak she really is and wonders what her subordinates would think of her if they saw her now. She imagines Awul next to her and Awul points out that they would probably laugh at her. Awul repeats the words that Rose told her by the fire and reminds her that things change. She must accept that so she can move forward. However, the fact that Rose led them will never change. They both say that they shouldn't overthink everything and Awul is glad to see that she remembered. Awul reminds her of her last words and those were that Rose should never change. The others appear to agree with Aul, and they remind her that Rose would punch them right in the face if she saw them acting the way she is. Rose realizes now how foolish she has been for just focusing on their deaths. Her subordinates were not like this, as they always look straight ahead with smiles on their faces. Rose snaps out of her depression and vows to never show weakness again. Her subordinates leave, and Rose promises to be someone that they can all admire. Rose removes her bandages and declares that she knows what she must do. A massive battle against the demon lord will be coming soon, so she has decided to create a force that saves lives. Many soldiers will be sent to their doom, but she vows not to let them die. Her force will need at least 5 people, and 2 of them have to be healers to start with. Most importantly though, they will need someone like herself. Someone who doesn't just heal, but a healer who can run around the battlefield, taking out threats as they go. This would be impossible for a normal person, but if she can find someone like that, then they might have a chance of fighting by her side without dying. Back to the present, Rose startles Usado when she reveals that she is glad she found him. Rose points out that he doesn't even know how precious his own life is. Not just any healer can get as strong as he has by just training. She asks him to wonder what the world would be like if it had more healers like herself, but Usado just uses his smart mouth to say that the world would be destroyed. Rose explains that she came up with the technique to train herself beyond her limits by using healing magic. It's incredibly difficult and Usado and herself are the only two people that can do it. Usado has all the traits she has ever wanted in a healer and she is sure that he won't die. Usado takes in all the compliments but Rose takes one look at his cheesy grin and is disgusted by it. Elsewhere, Amila is told that the bridge has been completed. The demon knight is glad to hear that and Amila reminds him that he can go as wild as he wants when the battle starts. This guy is confident as he warns that the battle might end in an instant since they are just up against humans. Amila reminds him not to underestimate them as they have the ones known as kidnappers. These kidnappers steal the wounded but the knight isn't worried about them. He just thinks they run away all the time but Amila points out that they are actually monsters. The knight is glad to hear that they might be able to make things interesting. He doesn't care what they are as long as they make him feel alive. Thanks for watching my recap. Sign up to my free newsletter if you want to show some support to the channel. Link is in the description.